this time on Graveyard Cars. Good news from Mark's daughter. Three girls and now she's got a boy coming. Is bad news for the shop. She does not want to do this season's autopsy reports. Mark tasks Aaron with finding a new host for his pet project, the autopsy reports. But will the show's producers unearth a hidden talent? Hi, I'm Cousin Dougie. That was bad, that was horrible. Or will the audition send Mark back to the drawing board? No, that's gonna be edited. Okay. When news arrives of our client's failing health. I guess Gilbert has taken a, a turn for the worse. Mark and Justin band together to finish his car while there's still time. Experience the final moments of this amazing 1971 Roadrunner's journey home and the very personal struggle to make it in time for the owner to see his car one last time. Now, one of my favorite cars that's been going through the shop lately is our 1971 Roadrunner. If you recall, this is a EV2 Tour Red black interior, four speed, 446 barrel. It's a Dana 60 car, 354 Dana. The car has already had all the drivetrain done. Uh, last season, to catch you up, that we went through and did all of the drivetrain and saw the body and painted courses done on it. Right now, it's just down to the final assembly stages of the car. So the good news there is, you know, that much of the work is done. The bad news is it should have been done years ago. Between COVID and the fallout from COVID, we've just really gotten behind. I want to get the car done and back to the gentleman. He's elderly, his health has been failing slowly, and I really, really want to get it back. So I just recently pulled Justin off of the car he's working on and put him on that full time, nonstop, till it's done. So today I'm getting ready to assemble the 1971 Roadrunner steering column. One well, of the first things you install is the collar with the key lock. Then it takes this spring right here. And this allows the collar to return back to its position when you release the key. In 1970, the very first year, Chrysler decided to make a locking steering wheel because of the theft problems. One of the things that they really needed to be aware of was if you can turn the key all the way off and pull it out, and lock that steering wheel, that's great news, unless you're doing 80 miles an hour down the road. So in 1970, to make sure that you could not turn the key all the way back to the opposition and remove the key, they had a manual interlock, an interlock that worked with the transmission and the shifter, whether it was an automatic or a stick shift, a bunch of relay rods and torque shafts got engaged, relayed all the way up to the column, rotated it, you could get the key out. So basically, those are the pieces he's putting in now. I always want to make sure that this is nice and greased up because it makes contact with that part of the steering collar. You don't want any snags. It takes these four screw style bolts. Sometimes when you want to tighten it up, it wants to tweak one way, but you got to make sure to do it slowly. Keep checking to see if that spins freely. This is our ignition switch. This is all original. You just feed these right through the collars. This has the key in buzzer. I can show you how that works after we get this installed. I'm just gonna set that right there. And then this piece right here, you just put a little bit of grease on the moving surfaces. So now we've got our key lock and everything in there with the ignition switch and the key in buzzer. I can show you how that works. When you insert the key, there's a little tab that comes off that key lock and presses the key in buzzer, which sends a signal when the car's off that says, hey, hey, your key's left in the car, pull it out. And then you have to turn the collar and unlock. Boom. You can pull the key out. I don't know if you've heard that Alyssa is pregnant. So the reason this young man is sitting next to me is because recently him and I went round and round like we do 
Uh, in the interest of transparency, we thought we'd share some of this with you. Those of you who are familiar with graveyard cars know that a few seasons ago, I came up with a thing called the autopsy report. Alyssa tried out for it, did a great job was doing a great job. If you go back and you watch them, they're very informative. They get to the point, they tell you how to decode a fender tag. Would you totally. agree with all Absolutely. that stuff? Well, Lissa, as you may or may not know, is pregnant with her fourth child, a boy. Oh, wow. Yep, finally. I didn't know that. That's cool. Three, three girls, and now she's got a boy coming. I'm trying to get him to call him Mini Trey. Uh, not interested. Well, I'll keep working on it. This, this is joke. what they call it's it. A joke. Anyway, she does not want to do this season's autopsy report. So I went to Aaron and I said, hey, listen, I want to keep doing the autopsy report. Alyssa doesn't want to do them. I had some ideas, just like I always do. I come in, I'm fertile, I got great ideas. I don't know if anybody's used this yet, uh, the confessional. I'm a friend first, a boss second, and probably an entertainer third. Um, I think the tray cam is working really what? well. I think everybody is a big fan of it. it. Gives you guys at home a chance to see what's going on behind the scenes. A Thai food restaurant, but it's in a ship and it's split right down the middle and it's called the Titanic. And immediately he just goes to some kind of defensive thing like he's an attorney or something and starts shooting me down. What about like a stripper or something? I attract it, not, they don't have to close up, but what? somebody really pretty. Okay, but I wasn't married to the idea of the stripper and it wasn't a sexual thing anyway. She didn't have to take her clothes off, just, I was just thinking, you know, usually they're attractive and so somebody attractive. Obviously, network TV, can't take it off. I don't see where it's a problem. Yeah, why don't you ask Suzanne what the problem is with that? <laughs> no. What is the problem with me coming up with clever ideas what, you, you say they're gimmicks or they're... Yeah, yeah. Novelty, I think, was the word I used. I think I said... Give me you, an you, example you, of a you, novelty. You punt what? the novelty. Well, I mean, in this particular case, you were asking to have a little person uh, do the presentation. What about a little person? Why is that who? Well, no, it's just you, you tend to, like, you go for these sort of mildly, can we, can we say, exploitative sort of approaches where you try to find... I try not to label people, sir. I don't see how it's a gimmick to have a little person doing this. It's exploitative. It? What's exploitative well, you, you, you about talked it? talked about lifting them up and putting them next to the fender tag so they could read it. All I was thinking is you could pick them up and put them right on the fender itself, right next to the tag, and they could read it. It'd be easier for them. And so this is a strategic move. Yeah. You don't like that idea? Fine. Oh, how about somebody that stutters? Why did we have to do? Because somebody that stutters is gonna repeat the code over and over again, right? You know how they'll never go to the right. second half of the word? They'll say tomorrow, right? They're trying to say tomorrow, but they go T -t -t -t. We are not doing stuttering. No, no, no. This is exactly what I was talking about during the 200th episode. You guys don't get to see all this stuff that we normally cut out, but this is what I have to deal with <laughs> day in, day out. He, he requested that we get a blind person to do this because he said that he could feel the numbers. It's braille. That's not Braille. Raised lettering is not Braille. Well, you read with your fingers. Okay, that part's true. I'm, I'm a blind just, person. I, okay. No, a blind person, think they, about it. Well, they could feel the- They're, That's right, that's, they're basically Braille anyway. Okay, so you're gonna create a sheet, a sign-up sheet for everybody. Get sure. me some names, get me some auditions. I can do that. Don't waste my time. I got lots going on, okay? Clearly. Well, I know that's sarcasm, that's fine. Don't take any of the employees that can't read. You know, half my team can't read, so I don't want them trying to read a fender tag. Okay, it's a waste of my time. And I wanna make sure that there's a priest or a nun, a blind person, a little person, and then somebody with, the, I don't know, what's that one Michael J. Fox has got? Oh. No, I'm gonna go use that. No, that's gonna be edited. Okay, they can read too. Yeah. Ah. Most of that is gonna be completely censored. After I have the ignition tumblers and collars in place, the next item that I install is the steering shaft. I always roll the shaft on a flat surface just to make sure that it's not bent, and then it just slides into place. This is our steering wheel lock gear. Just takes this little cover. So this is the steering shaft bearing. This is the upper part of the collar. This just slides right in. Once you got that pressed into place, this just slides right over. Here's the upper retainer for it. There we go. Just make sure that is in the slotted area so it doesn't 
want to come out. Now that piece is just locked right into place. You're lined up. This right here is the key light. This just feeds all the way through each section of the collar. It's right in there like that. One thing you, I have to be really careful with on these steering columns is these collars are, um, they're just aluminum and I don't want to get any of these screws cross-threaded. So I just take my time, make sure I got everything in the right threads. This right here is an original turn signal switch. This fits right into there. Here is the blinker lever. And then the next thing we can put on is the steering wheel itself. You align that slot with the slot inside the steering wheel. The principle behind this splined area on the steering column is so you can't put the steering wheel on wrong, all right? You only have so much adjustment in your tie rod ends. You can only turn them so far. Wheels go in, wheels go out. They basically have to be pointing straight. That steering wheel can't come in like this and go on at three o'clock, six o'clock, nine o'clock. It's gotta go on at 12 o'clock. Here's another really good example of, you know, this being a really nice original steering column. All of these wires, are still intact. Everything on the back side, you got both wires coming off. These are your horn pads. So you press those, mix your connection, and you honk your horn that way. And this just plugs right into the steering wheel. Just like that. Hold this on. So this is the original steering wheel cap snaps right into place. And that is it for the top end of the steering column. Got our left turn cancel. Let's check our right turn cancel. Boom, right there. Now that the steering column is all built out to the steering wheel, that's the upper part of it, the lower doesn't have nearly as many pieces. You've got a, a collar bearing that supports the steering column itself. You have a lower mounting plate and a lower mounting locating plate that need to go onto it. Then you can put the coupler on it. I mentioned it earlier, this coupler is splined with a 12 o'clock position on it that will go onto splines that are actually on the steering gear. That way, when it is all together, you know the steering wheel's right. This is the all-new 1971 Roadrunner two-door hardtop. Here's the new generation of trophy winners. So Justin needed a little bit of help on putting the front bumper on this car. A very unique front bumper. It looks very similar to a 1970 Charger in as much as it loops around the grill and the headlight openings. I am so excited oh, to see this thing on there. Yeah, let's do it. OK. Uh, we'll oh, yeah, you want to go this... in and do the rock up, yeah. right? I slide, like style. Slide this back. Think smart, right? Okay. Smarter, not harder? Yeah. Maybe? All right. So Sometimes. Bolt. So we got to come in a little more. OK, I'm lined up on my side to put Same one here. In. Yep, it's so good. easy. So on the 71 to 74s, they use a side bracket that goes inside of here. So now we'll roll this up into the side bracket. All right. And you got your tape. Good job. How's your side doing? Good. OK, is that bracket going under for you? Yes. Awesome. This should get us this should at our support adjustment so we can put already. the front one in, right? Yeah. OK. God, that's cool. I loved it when it came out. This, the little bird. Yeah. And this is the first car they ever did, any three-dimensional uh, emblem like that for, oh, with the bird It could head, be right? true, right. Now, is this set at height then? Is it, it should be. I had it. We might have to do a little fine tuning. Uh, yeah, just up a little bit. Why don't you tighten yours and then I'll tighten mine? Because mine's a little low, but yours looks really good. Okay. So if you tighten yours where it's at right now, I think we'd be good. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Great. How's that look? Uh, go down just a little bit. Perfect. Right there. Let me take a quick glance back here. Oh, that's good. Just tighten the lower brackets down. Once we have this massive front bumper in place, we can install the headlight bezels. You still like doing this by hand, don't you? I don't blame you. 
Better safe than sorry. Yeah, I'd rather not strip it. I agree. I agree. I understand. The next thing that we install is the lower balance panel. All right, what do we want to set the center one for anchoring just to kind of give it a little something, something? Yeah. To hold it? All right. Look at that. Is that cool or is that cool? It's going to look so great. You need a bolt? Yep. There you go. I'll right. lend you one of mine out of kindness of my dumb old heart. Oh, well, thank you. OK. There you go. I just love how well this car has been coming together. Because it came apart nice. It was yeah. a nice, it's all the difference in the world between a basket case garbage and a nice car. Right. OK, we're going to put the grill in next, the lower grill. All right, so one man job from here. So putting that grill in, to me, when you look at the front of that car, really finishes it off. Oh, yeah. Everything about the front end is now complete. You have the grill surround, which I love that look, by the way. Mm -hmm. Very 1970 Charger. -ish. Smooth, uh, yeah. I love yeah. it. <laughs> got the grill in. Uh, the bottom three you have to do from the top. Yeah. OK. So the, we got to let it down, put the bottom three screws in. But basically, we're done with the front end. So now we're going to set it on the ground, roll it out to the middle of the room. And we're going to put the over the roof stripes on. Are you excited about that? Oh, I'm super excited for that. First set we've ever done at Graveyard Cars. Yeah, over we the roof stripes. We can't mess up on it either. Sales code? V8X. Know. Let's do it. Now, did you order two sets or just the one? Four. Four? We've been here before. So all I was trying to do is bring you guys some must-see TV, but just like always, I had to concede, give in to the man who's trying to keep me down, and that's what we left. Oh, gosh. So. Okay, what Mark is talking about is he told me I could do whatever I wanted to to find a replacement, and so I thought, hey, let's just After make a shooting down all my ideas. Uh, let's just make a sign-up sheet. We'll put it out and let people just audition. You know, there might be some undiscovered talent out here, here. in the shop. Here. Here, yeah. Here. And, you know, and there's a couple of good candidates. You How'd know, that so go? Hi, I'm Cousin Dougie. That was bad, that was horrible. Hi, I'm Cousin Dougie. What, do I start now? Hi, I'm Josh. Josh, can we have you look over this Hi. direction? Hi, I'm Josh. This 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner was built on December 10th, 1969. This 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner was built on December 10th, 1969. Is this a 70? That's what I was supposed to say. Well, what am I? So it's a 70 built in 69? It happens to be one of the most original cars we've had here at Graveyard Cars. Let me show you. Actually, Doug, Doug can you <coughs> come back? Did I miss my line again? No, 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 we just need to stay right in your spot. I'm so glad you guys got to see this. This is great. Perfect example of why you never let the inmates run the asylum. Beautiful. Look, they're not actors, OK? <laughs> yeah, you got that right. And it just so happens to be this week's subject of What's it called? And it also happens to be the subject of this autopsy. <laughs> and the subject of this week's auth report autopsy. OK, folks, remember the fender tag is read from the bottom. The top to the bottom. Bottom to top. Oh, so here we go. So here we go. So here we go. So here we go. D32 represents a 727 torque flight transmission. <laughs> Three. Automatic. Is there going to be a test on this later? I hope not. <laughs> Let's see. I think I see a uh, line RM23. That's the first four characters of the VIN, which is the vehicle identification number. I've seen this train wreck many times here. And the difference is, I'm a good conductor now, and I'm putting the brakes on it. It, we're not doing any of that silly stuff. I'm taking over from here. Big Daddy got the train, okay? Yeah. Trey is in charge. <laughs> Trey's got the train, and sure. And, and I'm sure that whatever the idea that you come in with is not gonna in any way be gimmicky at all. If, if I can do what I think I want to do, I don't think it's a gimmick at all. You know, this Roadrunner is really well optioned. Now, even though the owner didn't want all of the things that it's optioned for to go back onto it, the over the roof stripe, he definitely wanted. See, his whole point is he has a race car that looks just like it. So all of the things on the race car he wants on this car, 
the race car is a clone. This one's a real car and has them. But the over the roof stripe, this is a complex, cool, reflective stripe that goes over the roof and tapers back with the Roadrunner swatch down at the bottom near the about the 12 o'clock position of the quarter panels on both sides. We happen to have an original car with an original over the roof stripe that Justin and I were able to pull in and get all the dimensions off of. It's indisputable when you have one put on at the factory and you know where it goes, because I've seen them all over the place at car shows, but you can't argue with an original car. Okay, so we've got <clears throat> wheel arch. Okay. To the bottom of the decal is three and seven eighths. Three and seven eighths. Belt or door, door jam opening. Holding it level here, we are at 22, 21, or yeah, 21 and three quarters. Yeah, because it's shrunk back. You got to go to yeah. that where it once had life. So we should end up right through here with literally a three quarter inch gap. So you could probably lay a piece of three quarter tape and then there. just butt it up right up against yeah, that. Yeah, that might work. Okay. And then if you want to hold that in, I'll yep. get you a middle zone. So from the rearmost roof line, where it shrinks. Eight and three quarter, maybe just a hair under it. Just a hair. But this could kind of go anywhere. So yeah, around this. I call it eight and three quarter. Eight and three quarter. And okay. I think once you have one, it's all laid out, it's going to find its own. Yeah. It's just yeah. that finite little bit of tweaks Twist and twists that you'll want to put. Still to come. Time is of the essence for the completion and delivery of the 1971 Roadrunner 446 barrel. Mark and Justin move from assembly to decals and the precise placement of the Roadrunner's stripe. But will the pressure of finishing and delivering this car in time cause Mark to make a critical mistake? Oh, 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 oh no, Mark. Find out when Graveyard Cars returns. This 1970 Roadrunner was built December 10th, 1969. It happens to be one of the most original cars we've seen here at Graveyard Cars. It also happens to be the subject of this week's autopsy report. Am I, am I uh, projecting enough? Okay, folks, remember that the fender tag is red from bottom to top, left to right. So here we go. E63 represents a uh, 380, 384 barrel something. D32 means a 237 torque flight automatic three speed transmission. Did we get all those right? No. EV5. E is a boy. EB5. EV7, which is the interior door color, which is the same as the exterior color? I feel like that's wrong. 179718, that's the, um, I, don't, I don't know what that is. <laughs> N97, which stands for no, noise reduction package. P31, this is a super cool option, power windows. V88, which stands for Stripe Delete, which is unfortunate because for the Roadrunner, that stripe is maybe one of the coolest um, parts of this car. And up to the last line, we have 26, which stands for the radiator, something to do with the radiator. And finally, END, which reads as end. So that's the end of this VIN tag and uh, consequently the end of this autopsy report. ready to install the over the roof stripes. Very exciting. So right now, Justin is wiping the car down with glass cleaner so we can get it chemically clean. Once it's chemically clean, we'll wipe it down with our tack cloth and we'll lay our slide gel on there, the application gel, and then we can place everything. And I'll show you as I'm placing it, how we're lining up those little lines, but this is really cool. Something else to say, these are reflective. 
That is so cool. These are all reflective and so is the little bird and so is the Roadrunner down there. So for me, one of the neatest things about that roof stripe and really so many of the decals and stripes that came on the Mopars back in the late 60s and early 70s was they made them reflective. Look at a Super B and you'll see that the decal is reflective. Go to a, uh, a Roadrunner, the, the graphics that go on the different ones, 69 and 70, they're reflective. The birds that go on the door is reflective. A lot of reflective stuff. So I think that was a clever idea. In fact, we've shown many times in the past when putting them on, how those things really do glow. They just change color the minute the lights hit them, which is a safety thing, right? I think it was also pretty cool. Oh, I love Marky Light Juice. Oh my God. Okay, let's dent the roof. It's okay. I don't charge extra for my craziness. Oh, look at that. Oh, sloppy. Sloppy Joes. I don't even know if they have reflective decals now on cars. I can't I don't say. think I so. I've never that seen one. Do. Okay. Oh, 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 oh. oh, no, Mark. Okay. Oh, 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 no, Mark. Well, you got lucky. I sure did. I got careless. That's what happens when you get careless. Okay. Does it need to go more? Yeah, I'm thinking there. Right there. I love your lines. That is great. So one thing that I really like to do is I like to mock these decals up into place, and I kind of set them in space where I know they need to go after we got all of our measurements. And then I take a piece of tape right up against the edge of the backing paper, and I lay it right there. And then I put a hash mark. Do you want to take this one? Yeah. And I'll take this one. Just make sure. I've been waiting weeks for this. Yeah, the squeegee's the exact same width as the stripe. Oh, even easier, there we go, yeah. That's nice. Go ahead and get it ready to okay. pull apart, and I'm just gonna put this on there. There you go. Great, thank you very much. And I'm gonna drag it into place. All right, this, my side is gonna be ready now just to sit. Just sit, okay. So well, we, while they sit, I can get the... If you wanna put the spoiler on, just can't wait to see it. Oh, I'm super excited. All right, so I'm lined up and looking nice. Good, okay. And how's yours looking? Looking good. Great, and just like that, just like that. Nice. So the wing that we're putting on here, a very nice part. This is not something used by in a catalog. We get these from Dante. They are replicas of the original. They come with all the original bracketry and support and the hardware that holds it in there. And it's kind of complex. The very first thing you have to do is once you put the spoiler down through the holes in the trunk lid, you need to marry those two together. And that's just a captive washer style nut that goes into place and gets tightened down. Not over tightened, but tightened down. The problem with that is if it didn't have any support and you're doing 60 miles an hour on the freeway, that deck lid is gonna get warped and beat to death and it's gonna end up ripping those holes out. So they have a support system in there. Now, one of the things you gotta make sure of is once you get the uh, spoiler on the trunk lid, that when you preload those nuts, so special nuts up against the bracket, you don't go too far, because if you go too far, it's gonna raise the spoiler up. So if you stand back and look at it, it's gonna have a swelling around where the brackets go. If, you, if it's not down far enough against the bracket, the support bracket, and you suck it down with the lower nut, then it's gonna create a swimming pool. So you can dial that thing in by hand until you look and sight across the deck lid and know that it's not pulling or pushing the metal, then you can put the outer nuts on. It's in place. A lot of setup for a but wing. it's well thought out. Yeah, really it's good. It's not like we did as kids where you just punched a hole in your trunk lid and <laughs> have a nice day. Okay, we'll put our lock washer and jam nuts in place. Beautiful. And 
just want to watch that spoiler when you tighten it down to make sure nothing goofy happens. So it starts walking it in or out. Yeah. Right now I'm looking real good. Looking good? Okay. All right, so we've got a spoiler on, got our decals on the roof. That's great. And so we're gonna let those set overnight. Looks good, good job. Excellent, thank you. Oh, love it, look at that. That's great, it looks so good. All right, so we've got our mirrors. We can put these on. It's really nice. These are his original mirrors. I've been working really hard on the assembly of the 71 Roadrunner. Now I'm installing the outside mirrors, the trim, and the ornamentation. The cable retaining clips are still intact, which is great. So a reproduction gasket. This one fits right in there. Feed the cable retainers through. Get that all lined up nice. Be sure to take your time and not cross thread. The next item to install are the turn signal indicators, and the sales code is L31. Right, time for the hood inserts. This is just like any other decals we do. Use a tack cloth, make sure there's nothing contaminating the surface. We try our best not to get any dirt nibs under these decals. All right, so here's a little factoid for you. Justin is installing the decals on the louvers that go in the sport hood. That's the way this car was optioned, okay? Calls out 446. Now, if this car were an air grabber car, he wouldn't be doing this because they don't use the louvers. They certainly wouldn't have 446 barrel on the louver that doesn't exist either. Because Mopar usually called out the engines on either the fenders or the hood. So where, if you had an N9671 Roadrunner, meaning an air grabber, 446 barrel engine, where would the decal go? I'll give you three seconds. Two, one right above the side marker on the fenders. So when you see one going down the road and the decal that says 446 Burrow or 383 or Hemi is above that side marker, it's got an air grabber hood or should have an air grabber hood on it, at least from the factory. Just want to get it nice and centered in space. We've got a good reveal all along here. We can start squeegeeing this thing out. There we go. Time for the header emblem. This is his original one, just nice and restored. Nice and easy emblem to install. Another really cool decal on this car is the Plymouth Circular Decal. I really love this. It fits perfectly around the emblem area and it really sets off that header panel. See, it's got the Plymouth call outs. Want to make sure those are, when you're looking at it, they're facing right side up. The orientation of these have to be perfect. Here we go. Stay tuned. With the final steps of assembly complete, this 1971 Roadrunner 4-speed 446 barrel is now road ready. But before this beloved bird begins its journey home, Mark must put it through the paces on the mean streets of Springfield. And with a restoration this long, even Mark can forget a crucial request from the owner. Didn't write it down anywhere, completely forgot. Especially if it's not on the fender tag. Finally, with transport services struggling to stay on schedule, the question looms large. Will the car make it across the country in time for the owner to see his car in person one last time?
Anybody trying to move any kind of cars right now knows how difficult it is. Coming up with the conclusion of Graveyard Cars. You know, we've been making great progress on the car, but I did get a phone call from Greg, who is Gilbert Gay's son. That's the owner of the car. See where we're at on the car, how it's going, because uh, I guess Gilbert has taken a, a turn for the worse. Uh, was in ICU, in and out of the hospital. And so we did end up sticking the rest of the team uh, on the car. And it is something to keep him motivated, you know, because I was doing that with my mom. When my mom was sick, I was coming up with anything, you know, pictures of the dogs, kids, grandkids, telling stories, doing my best comedy stuff, you know, trying to keep her spirits up. Uh, I thought maybe send him some pictures of the car. We just got the interior in it, all the interiors in. Send him the picture. And bless his heart, 83 or four years old, sick, in the hospital, sick. He says, those seats are supposed to be orange. So his kid writes me back, Greg writes me back, supposed to be orange inserts. No, not according to the fender tag. So I write back, no, I'm sorry, maybe he's confused, you know, he's old, he's confused, right? Well, somebody's confused, but it wasn't Mr. Gay, it was me. Turns out I had forgot all about a four-year-old conversation, because this is an old car, it's been around here, where he said, I know it isn't coded for the orange interior, but I would like the orange interior. Sure, Mr. Gay, no problem, we'll take care of it. Didn't write it down anywhere and completely forgot. He remembered, sick as he was, he remembered. So the very next day, I sent our driver up to Portland, pick up some new old stock material for both the orange and the black, then took him over to John, Stan's upholstery, and had him completely redo everything in factory, original appearance and material, and did it all in three days. So my favorite part of the entire build, of course, is the final drive, the shakedown, where you get to really go out, put it through its paces. I want it to fail. I want something to quit working. I want the gas gauge to quit working. I want it to have a rattle, a bump, a knock, a scratch, something. Because if it's gonna do, I want it to do it with me, not with Mr. Gay when he gets home or whomever our client is. So this is my favorite part, going out for that nice test drive. As I drive this car, I'm reminded of what a friend of mine, Gordon, said. He had a 71 Roadrunner. He had Cudas, Challengers, stuff like that. But he always felt like his 71 Roadrunner was one of the best driving cars, if not the best driving car, of all of his Mopars, just because of the geometry and the size. Talking to Tony D'Agostino, he feels the same way. Great running, driving, tracking car. They handle well, they're comfortable, they're, you don't feel boxed up like you do in an e-body. All right, so the great news is the car is done. It's beautiful, it's ready to go home. The bad news is I did get another phone call uh, from Greg saying that dad was not doing very well and uh, didn't, didn't hold a lot of hope out though, that he was gonna make it really long. Wanted to just check in where we were at. So, you know, I hate that stuff. I hate it, because I always feel guilty because number one, I'm overdue to have it done. And two is it always just brings up bad memories for myself. But anyway, I got on a uh, call real quick with our shipper. I did a little bit of begging and I was able to get it picked up that Thursday with the promise that it would be to Mr. Gay the following Thursday. So we were all just like, all right, that's really good timing. It's a miracle that we can get anything shipped that fast in today's world. Anybody trying to move any kind of cars right now knows how difficult it is. So that was really, really good news.
So it turns out that they were actually able to get the Roadrunner over to the hospital on Wednesday, a day earlier than they had planned to even have the car there, and then they would have needed another day. So they were figuring maybe Friday, run it up there to the hospital and let dad check it out. But he got there on Wednesday. They rolled dad down, again, not very good shape. They rolled him down in his wheelchair, bless his heart, out to the car and he was just smiling, maybe for the first time. He was really happy to see his car, his baby, you know? So anyways, um, they even started the car for him. They revved it up, and he was, he was very, very happy. Then on uh, Thursday, that's when Greg, he call, Greg called me, and he told me about the story that Dad got to see it, and then he said his dad actually passed on Thursday. So Mr. Gay uh, passed away after he saw his car. And my point that I've said before, if you haven't had a car in your life that meant something, it's okay. I said it doesn't make you a better or worse person than anybody else, but to a lot of people, to our hundred and some clients out there now and the 50 or 100 that are in the past, these cars meant something to them. Go back and look at the reveals. Look at them. Look at the emotion. It isn't because the car's shiny and it's worth twice as much as when they brought it in. It's because it's a link to the past for all of us, for me, for you, for anybody that has one of these cars. It's a, it's a safe deposit box that we get to finally get into and open up some memories that we haven't had for a long time. Maybe we forgot about them. It, it just isn't very often that um, this scenario plays out. And I like to just kind of believe it was divine intervention, I guess. It, here's a guy who was really sick and maybe should have maybe left earlier. I don't know. I don't know. None of us know. But I'd like to believe he was waiting for that car to get home. And I kind of think his son thought the same thing too. That's how much it meant. And after that, he was whole, right? He could kind of quit fighting. You, you hear stuff like that, right? And, and we're all speculating because none of us know. But I think it's a pretty heartwarming thing. And I think it, and I think for people out there that have to justify the money they're gonna spend restoring a car to the rest of the family, or why that car's taking up space in the garage when we could get it out and put a pool table in there, and why the car's beside the house rotting away, you don't have to make any excuses, that's why. Call up Greg, ask him why. Call up Mrs. Cook, ask her why call up any of the people that we've done the cars for over the years and they'll tell you the car is a part of their life it was a part of their life then and now it's a brand new part of their life and I don't think as a as a shop owner and as a restoration guy I could ask for anything more meaningful to validate who I am and what I've dedicated my life to do so rest in peace Mr. Gay